Very good. Very good to, to be here with you. I have a, a very serious question, and that is, is there a place for meat in the human diet? There are a lot of people who think there is. Certainly, I think most people agree there is not a place for the amount of meat that's consumed. But there are people who ask the question, and legitimately so, should there be a little meat in the human diet? I mean, some diets that are very similar to what I recommend, such as the Pritikin diet, they had a little bit of meat. The macrobiotic diet, they had a little bit of fish. Certainly, I think a healthy diet can include a little bit of meat, a little bit of fish. I mean, it can, but the problem is a little bit becomes a lot for most people, and so it doesn't stay a little bit and doesn't stay harmless. But I think we ought to look at the subject as to where meat fits in the diet and really whether it adds or it detracts and whether you should totally exclude it or maybe partially exclude it, maybe get control of it. These are fair subjects for you and I to discuss. When I talk about meat, I'm talking about the muscular tissue of an animal. I'm talking about the muscles of cows and pigs and lambs and chickens and turkeys and fishes and shellfishes and all animals. I'm talking about their muscles. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about meat. And you must realize when you eat the meat, you're also eating things that are within that muscle, such as tendons and nerves and blood vessels. That was one of the most disgusting things when I was growing up. My mother would make a big roast beef on Sunday, and you'd take a slice, and this blood vessel would pop up. And even then, I'd go, yuck. It was not appealing. And then there are organ meats, such as liver, which I could never stand, kidneys, thymus, pancreas, testicles, intestines. And then we have especially meats like brains and cheeks and tongues and tails and hearts and lungs and the bone marrow of animals. And of course, when you put those all together, what do you have? A hot dog, right, a hot dog. That's a specialty meat. Uh, in Britain, they call these specialty meats, they call them awful, spelled O-F-F-A-L. But you know what it sounds like, awful, yes. The muscles of animals are very similar. And let me take a case in point. Let's talk about the cholesterol content of various muscles so you can see the similarity. If you look at the cholesterol content of three and a half ounces of beef, it's 85 milligrams, lamb 82, pork 90, veal 88, skinned white chicken, 85 milligrams of cholesterol, just like beef. Turkey, 83 milligrams, mackerel 75, perch, 115 milligrams of cholesterol. They're all virtually the same. Muscles are all made of fat and protein. No carbohydrate, no dietary fiber. They all have very similar nutritional characteristics. So as a consequence, those of you who are health-minded, who switch from red muscle to white muscle and you're surprised because you don't get healthier will realize you made no change at all. Nothing significant and worthwhile. In fact, there have been multiple studies and they all show the same thing. When you switch people from red meat to chicken and fish, their blood cholesterol stays the same. So if you think you're incurably ill, think again. You're just missing vital information. I love Bizarro. He had this interesting cartoon. It says, I'll have the cruelly tortured for its entire life, kept alive with drugs, slaughtered inhumanely, processed unsanitarily, and cooked at very high temperatures to kill the salmonella sandwich. And she says, fries with that. Now that's funny, isn't it? That's funny. Why is that funny? Because we all know that's true. If we didn't know that was true, then it wouldn't be funny. We all know these things. We all know there are serious problems with consuming meat, don't we? Let's just quickly review what some of those problems are. Meat is high calorie, which promotes obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. It's high in fat, which promotes obesity, cancer, and diabetes. Remember, this is an artificial dissection of the characteristics of meat. It's not just the cholesterol in meat or the fat in meat that gives you heart disease. It's all the characteristics that rot your arteries. So by separating these things, I'm just making an artificial situation. But that's kind of the way people look at things. And it's not good because often what folks will do, particularly in the food industry, is they'll try and make you a low fat version of something unhealthy. Well, it's still something unhealthy because it has all of the other negative qualities associated with it. It's high in saturated fat. That's the kind that rots your arteries, gives you strokes and heart attacks. It's high in protein, which causes kidney damage, osteoporosis, and kidney stones. And along with being high in protein, it's also high in 
Acid, that's right. That's because of all those sulfur-containing amino acids and all those amino acids, which gives you acid, which takes and dissolves your bones. Let's take a look at the acid load that you find in meats. Now, this is an important subject. There's actually a calculation done. It's called the renal acid load. And it's how much a particular food imparts upon your body in terms of the amount of acid when you eat it. The renal acid load of beef is 6.3, chicken 7.1, fish 9.3, and cheddar cheese 10, the highest acid load that you get. Now, there are a couple of vegetable foods that give you a minor amount of acid. These would be your legumes, like beans, peas, and lentils, and also your grains. They give you a little bit of acid. Well, legumes, or beans, peas, and lentils, and grains like rice and wheat grain, these are really high nutrient density foods, so it shouldn't surprise you that these are a little on the richer side, and as a consequence may give you a little bit of acid load, and maybe foods that you ought to eat with a little bit of caution. I've always recommended that people keep their bean, pea, and lentil intake to about a cup cooked a day. If they're healthy, if they have protein-related problems like kidney disease, liver disease, osteoporosis, kidney stones, they may want to cut them back even more, and that applies to grains too. After all, what is the purpose of a bean or grain? It's to supply the nutrients so that that little baby plant can get a good start in life. That's what it's for. So it's got to be high nutrient density, and so it has lots of protein and a little tiny bit of acid. Not a lot compared to those animal foods. But look at your alkaline foods. If you look at your other vegetables, you look at your fruits, they're very alkaline, like, for example, a potato is minus 5 on the renal acid load. Bananas are minus six, apples minus five, spinach minus 56. Can you imagine if you made yourself a stew with some beans and some grains and some vegetables in it, what would happen is you'd have an alkaline stew, which would be very healthy for your bones. Meats are high in cholesterol. Remember that chicken, fish, beef, pork, all basically the same amount of cholesterol. They are high in iron. Now, you've been taught iron is good for you. Well, okay, if you have iron deficiency, anemia it may be good for you, but the concern is, is that iron may actually promote heart disease, along with cholesterol and saturated fat and so on. It may promote heart disease. And the clue to that comes from the fact that women have less heart disease when they menstruate. So the thought is when they lose that iron through their menstrual flow, it protects them from getting heart disease. We also know that people who donate blood in other words, lose iron by donating to the Red Cross, they have less heart disease. Iron acts as a powerful oxidant. It is a free radical. It donates electrons. It causes damage. So having too much iron in the system is not good. You don't want more iron in your system, as the beef industry advertises. It's not in your best interest. And of course, on the other end, you don't want to be iron deficient and anemic either. But enough is enough. So this high iron is associated with high risk of strokes and heart attacks. It has no dietary fiber. No dietary fiber, what happens is you can't make a decent bowel movement, so you get constipated. No carbohydrate, so you become fatigued. You run out of energy. There is no good athlete out there that would eat a low carbohydrate diet. All winners, all triathlon, all swimmers, all marathon runners, all endurance athletes, they carbohydrate load. They're near vegetarians, they have to be, because carbohydrates are only present in plant foods. You cannot, if you're going to be a winner, live, live on these low, no carbohydrate meats. You just can't do it. You'll lose the race. So if you're just trying to win the race of chasing your two-year-old around, where are you going to get the energy? Not from meat, not from chicken, not from fish, not from beef, not from pork. You're going to be a tired athlete. There is no calcium unless you eat the bones in any of your meats. And so low calcium deficiency may result in poor tissues if you get it low enough. And it's real hard to get it low enough. And it's deficient in essential fats, which take and form your nervous system and may lay the groundwork for diseases such as multiple sclerosis. It's full of environmental contaminants, which promote cancer, Parkinson's disease, various kinds of brain damage. It'll make you stupider. And when you cook, meat, it forms its own set of cancer-causing chemicals like heterocyclic amines and benzopyrenes, very strong cancer promoters. You don't even have to burn it. All you have to do is heat it, and it forms these cancer-causing substances. And of course, it's loaded with microbes. 
The reason that meats and dairy products are so loaded with environmental contaminants has to do with the food chain. It has to do with biomagnification. Bioaccumulation is another term that you should be familiar with. What happens is this, is these environmental chemicals such as DDT, DDE, heptachlor, dioxin, these environmental chemicals, they get in the environment, they get in the water supply, they get on the grasses and they get on the grains. And what happens is the cow comes along and eats and drinks and picks up a certain amount of these environmental contaminants. Well, the problem is, is these environmental contaminants are fat soluble. They're attracted to fat and they get stored in the body fat of the animal and concentrated. They become biomagnified. They bioaccumulate. They accumulate in the fat tissue and are magnified as they move up the food chain. So you go and eat the cow. The cow has taken and concentrated a couple of pounds of environmental chemical that's on all the grasses and grain that he eats for a whole year and it gets into the cow fat and you go eat a few pounds of beef and you get those chemicals in your system and you store them in your body fat and it gets more accumulated because you eat pounds and pounds and pounds of cows and who's at the top of the food chain? It's baby suckling off mother's breast. This is not just a topic for those of you who are worried about your present health. It's not just a topic for adults. This is a topic for your children and your grandchildren. They need to know that they are laying the seeds of disease for their unborn children. They are laying unhappiness for their family by accumulating these toxins in their system when they're young children. The meat that they eat, the dairy products they consume, these poisons get into their system and are stored in their fat for a lifetime. And then when they get pregnant, these substances influences the child, the developing child. And then when they breastfeed, which I certainly hope they do, these pesticides get dumped into the baby. Half of a, half of a mother's load of pesticide gets dumped into the baby within six months of breastfeeding. An important message to teach your children. And these environmental chemicals are serious health hazards, a threat to you in many ways. Cancer to Parkinson's disease, other damage to your system that we don't even know about. Now let's uh, amplify a little bit the topic of microbes and how they are a problem when you consume meat and other animal products, including dairy products. It's estimated that 25 to 250 million cases of foodborne illness occur annually, and it's estimated that 6,000 to 10,000 deaths occur in the United States alone every year as a consequence of foodborne illnesses. And almost every one of those illnesses is due to animal product consumption, directly or indirectly. Can you imagine if there were 6,000 cases of mad cow in this country every year? I mean, people would never touch beef, would they? But I guess it's okay to die from salmonella and E. coli and those other things. Must be more pleasant than dying from mad cow. Because so nobody seems to react. Now, why is it that these animals are such a threat to you and I? It's because we're animals. You see, we have systems similar to cows and pigs and chickens. And as a result, organisms that are designed to function in those other animals function in our bodies too because we have similar systems. However, plants, they have completely different systems. And as a result, organisms that infect plants are not a threat to us. You have no friends with Dutch elm disease. <laughs> None of your relatives have aphids. Now you say, well, how about that E. coli that got into the apple juice and made the kids sick? Well, it's because the apples fell off the tree and landed in the cow dung. It's only cows that grow that kind of infectious E. coli that's so dangerous. It's because of contamination from the cow dung. You say, well, how about the uh, strawberries? They get hepatitis. Well, hepatitis doesn't grow on strawberries. It's somebody, some farm worker in the field made doo-doo on the strawberries. That's how it got into your food. Plant, plant Diseases don't threaten you or your family unless they're contaminated with animal products. And these are real problems, real threats, not only from days of misery and lost work, but actual risk to your life from these particular organisms. And one easy way to avoid this is to change your diet. Now, in the face of all this knowledge, knowledge you accumulated long before you listened to me, all the science that's out there, all the research, even the public opinion. Why do people continue to eat this stuff? What are our excuses for continuing to eat these kinds of foods in the face of all this information? 
Well, the first excuse I hear from people is it's not going to bother me. I'm indestructible. I've got these wonderful healthy genes. My genes will protect me, they say. My grandfather, he smoked cigarettes, drank whiskey, and ate pig fat on his bread and lived to be 95, they tell me. Well, you know, that may be so. Your grandfather may have been lucky, and it also may have been he exercised a lot more, and the whole world was a lot different then. I mean, these problems with the pesticides only became a problem after World War II. The foods that your grandfather and grandmother consumed were a lot cleaner, let me tell you, and they were a lot more fruits and vegetables in their diet, and they were a lot more active, and the world was a lot different then. But I hear about the genes all the time. I got good genes. I want to tell you about my genes. I want to introduce you to my great-grandmother. We call her Old Mom. My great-grandmother, she died on my son's birthday, Craig, who some of you know. That was uh, 21 years ago. And the last thing she heard was that Johnny had a baby boy, and we named him after your husband. And then she died at 106. Uh, she was a great lady, a very opinionated woman, to say the least. I can remember when we were little kids, my sister and I would go over to her house, and we loved eating meat. My parents believed that meat was so good for you. Had to eat lots of milk, lots of meat. That was really American food. After all, they could afford it. And so I'd be eating lots of meat along with my sister. And my, my great-grandmother would say to me, you know, you eat too much meat. It's going to make you sick. Well, as time went on, I changed my diet. I became a pure vegetarian. I remember one time when I was about, mm, oh, it was about 20 years ago. She was about uh, 103. And we were sitting around the house talking, and she sent me out for a hamburger for herself. And she had a specific hamburger in mind. It was one with this wafer-thin patty and a little bit of mustard, a little ketchup, a couple of pickles, and white bread buns on both sides, about this big, cost 15 cents. So I brought it back to her, gave it to her. She opened it up. She cut it in quarters, picked up a quarter, shook it in my face, said, you know, you eat a little more meat, you'd be a little healthier. <laughs> and then she proceeded to eat two quarters, and she put the rest away for later. She was a moderate person. She drank wine on Christmas. She ate a little bit of everything. She lived to be 106 because she was moderate. I'm not moderate. I do everything with great lust, great enthusiasm. I know this about myself. I'm not going to change my personality. That's the way I am. But what I've been able to do is I've been able to focus this enthusiasm, this energy of mine on good things. Instead of destructive things, what I, should, I used to do. And many of you here are the same way. If you have that kind of lust and enthusiasm for life, focus it on good things, not destructive things. If you happen to be like old mom, yeah, you're probably going to make it to 100 and some. But by the way, she could have been healthier. She had severe osteoporosis and hip, broken hips. So she could have been healthier. She could have had a better life. Now, that was on my mother's side of the family. On my father's side of the family, we had Old Pop. We're not very original in names, I know. But we called him Old Pop. And he was born on my birthday. Excuse me, I was born on his birthday. <laughs> and that was very important to him. I was his uh, favorite grandson. And uh, Old Pop, as long as I could remember, he would have bacon and eggs for breakfast. And he would have meatballs and onions for dinner. And he lived to be 87 years old. But he lived in misery. The last 15 years of his life, he couldn't walk 15 feet because the arteries in his legs were so closed up, they just got a trickle of blood to his feet. He didn't say he was overweight. You see his picture. He didn't think he was overweight. He said he had a sway back. Well, I would disagree. He had all kinds of significant health problems, and he could have enjoyed a better life if he would have taken better care of himself. Yeah, he did survive, but certainly not ideally. So I want you to know I got genes. But those of you who know me and have heard my history, you know that they didn't protect me. At age 18, I had a massive stroke. At age 22, I had major abdominal surgery because of severe intestinal problems. And at age 24, my mother called me fat. So I was destined to be dead in my mid-30s. 
except for the fact that I was fortunate enough to understand what good things I should focus my attention on. And you can do the same. Now, the other excuse I have about why people eat meat is it tastes good. Life wouldn't be worth living if I couldn't have my meat, people tell me. <clears throat> well, what I challenge you with is the fact that meat really doesn't taste good. It's basically yellow and brown food that's tasteless or somewhat disgusting tasting. Maybe has a greasy flavor to it. Fruits and vegetables, by the way, are very interesting. They have more color, flavor, texture, and aroma than any other meal plan that you could possibly design compared to meats, which are brown and yellow. Mm, yucky looking. <laughs> How many of you serve boiled chicken to your best friend for dinner? Huh? Or maybe even grilled beef with nothing on it? I don't think so. How do you make these meats taste good? You load them with sauces. Yes, yeah, salt. That's one thing. That's what I used to do. My dad taught me a good steak. This is how you cook a good steak. You take a box of salt and you pour it on one side over the barbecue and let it soak into the meat and then turn it over to the other side and pour the other half a box on the other side and turn it over and cook it and that's a good steak. That's how you got the flavor. The salt, of course. The salt. The tip of the tongue tastes with pleasure salt. But you can also load it up with sauces that are full of salt and sugar and spices like ketchup or steak sauce, barbecue sauce, sweet and sour sauce. That's how you make meat taste good. That's the only way you can get it down. It doesn't taste good. We're told we need to eat meat because we have to have it for protein, for essential amino acids, for iron, for zinc. But the scientific literature says that's not true. And after all, you can grow Vegetarian people, there are many of them with no meat in their diet. There have been millions and millions of vegetarians that walk this earth. They've survived without meat. The biggest animals that walk this earth are vegetarians, like hippopotamuses, giraffes, elephants. There's got to be plenty of nutrients in plants to support these processes. And the scientific literature clearly shows that these are false statements, that you need to eat meat to get protein, essential amino acids, zinc, or iron. The problems with meat is too much fat, too much iron, too much protein and too much cholesterol. And too little calcium, vitamin C, niacin, essential fats, no dietary fiber and no dietary carbohydrates. Those are the problems. It's the wrong food for people. Now, one last excuse that people give as to why you need to eat meat. And actually, I'll have to tell you, I'll admit to you, there's one criticism for the kind of diet I recommend, which is a diet based on starches like potatoes, rice, corn, with the addition of fruits and vegetables that contains no animal products. There's one criticism that holds some scientific merit. You can't criticize it for insufficient iron, insufficient calcium, insufficient protein, amino acids. There's not a bit of scientific research that would support that argument. So nobody tries to do it. But in desperation, you realize people like to hear good news about their bad habits. So in desperation to defend people's own diets, what they will say is, well, aha, we finally found the reason that you need to eat meat. It's for B12. Because you can't get B12 from a vegetarian diet, they say. Well, there's a little truth to what they say. There is B12 in meat. It's actually stored there in meat. It's not made by animals. B12 is made by bacteria. Bacteria make the B12. Animals will take and chew on foods that are loaded with bacteria. They'll store the B12 in their tissues. And then if you eat the meat, you'll get the B12. If you eat plants, you may be eating the same plants that are loaded with bacteria. You can get B12 that way, too. Plus, you have B12 in your mouth through your intestinal tract, B12 making bacteria that you get B12 from. That supplies B12. But there are probably some cases of B12 deficiency related to a vegetarian diet. Let me tell you how this all started. Back in the late 40s, they discovered a disease called pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia resulted in B12 deficiency. They found out that they were getting this B12 deficiency problem also when they took and they cut people's stomachs out. Back in those days, they figured that ulcer disease was due to too much acid production, due to being neurotic or emotionally stressed out. And so they cut part of your acid producing stomach out. Well, when they did that, they also cut out a section of the stomach that made something called intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor combines with B12 so B12 can be absorbed later on in the small intestine. So once they started cutting stomachs out, they found the last discovered vitamin, which was B12. 
And then they ask, well, where does B12 come from? Well, they found out it was made by bacteria, but it was also found in large quantities of meat. And then they said, well, there must be a whole bunch of B12 deficiency in vegetarians, so let's go look for it. And so they have launched multiple studies looking at tens of thousands of people who are vegetarians looking for B12 deficiency, and they've almost come up empty-handed. If I was going to review the literature, and there are some criticisms of even these studies, but let's just Let's just say, for argument's sake, that there are six, maybe 20 cases of B12 deficiency described in the world literature. There certainly aren't very many, but they get attention. For example, if somebody develops B12 deficiency, it will hit the major medical journals. It will be accepted in the best medical journals in the world, and it will hit major headlines all across the country. Vegetarian, somebody who gives up your favorite foods, meat, develops B12 deficiency. May not even be a serious problem, but the fact that they developed the disease from not eating your favorite foods, it gets headlines because people like to hear good news about their bad habits. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. So there are very, very few cases of B12 deficiency, but I wouldn't want anybody to become B12 deficient. So ever since I started recommending this kind of healthy diet, I recommend it in all my books, all my DVDs, videos, and so on. If you're going to follow this diet for more than three years, it takes about 20 years to run out of your B12 stores, so I want to be conservative, more than three years, or if you're pregnant or nursing a baby, you're to add a non-animal source of B12 to your diet. You can buy a supplemental B12 pill in the store, in the natural food store, and take that. You solve the risk, solve the problem. Now, you might ask me, why, why, why would there be any kind of deficiency in a diet that I think is so perfect for people, that people are so well designed for? And that's a good question. And the answer is, remember, B12 is made by bacteria. In our modern society, we live in a very hygienic way. We wash everything. We put uh, antiseptics on our kitchen counters. We take antibiotics. We kill all the friendly bacteria. Louis Pasteur, discovered bacteria and wrote about the effect of bacteria on human disease. But he didn't consider all bacteria harmful and enemies as we've decided to make them. He understood even back then that bacteria were necessary for human health. So when we live in an environment that eliminates, eradicates helpful bacteria, we could get into some problems. Throughout most of human history, we've been living with our cows, our pigs, our chickens, and all the bacteria that they seem to give us, all the helpful, friendly bacteria. And so that's where I believe we got all our B12. I believe we live in an unnatural environment today that's just too clean. As a result, your risk of B12 deficiency is about one in a million. And it's a mild problem. It's a, an anemia that's well tolerated and easily reversible. And it could also be a neurologic problem. We like tingling or loss of sensation, which is reversible until late stages. Now compare that risk of giving up meat totally, compare that risk to the risk of eating meat without reservation like most people in Western society do. A one in two chance of dropping dead of a heart attack, a one in eight chance of getting breast cancer, a 60% chance of being obese, I mean, really, the magnitude of risk is drastically different, wouldn't you say? So if you're going to make an error, I'd certainly make an error in the direction of B12 deficiency. Let's talk about one of the biggest concerns that people have when they go on a meat-free diet. When they give up meat, what they worry about most, you ask your friends, you tell them you're going to become a vegetarian. What's their response going to be? Where are you going to get your protein? Where are you going to get your protein? Well, let me give you a brief history about protein about the passion, the social bigotry, the rats, and eventually enlightenment that has come about concerning our protein needs. Have you ever wondered where the need for protein came from? How that was established? The need for protein was established in the 1800s, and it was established by various scientists. For example, a guy named Carl Voigt from Germany. He developed what is known as the Voigt Standard for protein or Charles Atwater from the United States. Various investigators respected scientists in those days. What they did is they determined how much protein people needed, and they did it in a very interesting way. What they did is they looked at populations of people, and they made this assumption. 
those people who could afford a choice in diet are going to make the right choice. And so when they looked at people who were, had jobs, who were soldiers, who were workers, who had money coming in, and they could choose whether they ate meat or vegetables or not, what they found is these people chose a lot of meat. So they said that innately, by intuition, people must always choose the right diet. Therefore, we'll look at what these people eat and we'll say that's the right amount of protein that a human being should eat. Compared to people who say who weren't wealthy, who couldn't afford the meat, obviously if they could have, they'd have made the right choice for the nutrition. Now think about your friends and relatives and the kinds of right choices they make. Pizza Hut, Big Macs, greasy tacos. You think there's anything innate up here that tells you how to get proper nutrients? I don't think so. Well, that is how your nutrient, your protein needs were determined by these kinds of observations. Not a single scientific study. It was determined by social bigotry, by making the assumption that fairly affluent people are smarter than people that aren't affluent and they would make the right choices and therefore that's how much protein you need. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, I'm not joking. So what was determined is you needed about 110 to around 185 grams of protein a day based on that simple observation. One of my heroes, Russell Henry Chittenden. He was uh, head of Yale's biochemistry division for about 30 years. He was one of the principal investigators to look into protein. Back in the uh, late 1800s, he got the notion that maybe we didn't need all that protein and maybe we ought to investigate things a little bit more scientifically. So what uh, Dr. Russell Henry Chittenden did is he looked around various parts of the world and he said, you know, maybe there's a problem here. I see people living in Central America, in Africa, in Asia, they're living on less than half the amount of protein that uh, Carl Voigt and Charles Atwater recommend. And they're hardworking people, they grow normal sized bodies. I also know vegetarians, he says. I know them from Europe, I know them from the United States, and they don't eat any meat at all, and they grow normally too. So maybe this is not correct. Maybe we don't eat all, need all that kind of protein. So he decides he's gonna do some experiments. Now he's concerned, and so he doesn't wanna rush things. He doesn't wanna hurt anybody by causing a protein deficiency disease problem. So he starts his experiment out with himself. He changes his own diet. He changes his diet and he takes in about a third the amount of protein that's usually recommended. He takes in about 40 grams of protein a day. And he reports that he lost weight, his sick headaches went away, his energy increased, and the arthritis in his knees disappeared. And he said, wow, that's pretty neat. We should expand this experiment. So he took some of his non-active Yale colleagues, took six of his fellow professors, no hard physical activity because you don't want to rush this experiment. He put them on a similar diet and he found that they also lost weight and got rid of their health problems. Now this is before 1900 this was all done. And then he says, well, we'll test this a little further. We'll go to the hospital of the Army Corps and we'll take some of these men who are much more physically active. And he took 13 men who were relatively active all week long, but they actually exercised vigorously one day a week. 13 of these men, and they got the same results. They became more vigorous, their health problems disappeared, they lost weight. And then he did the ultimate test. He took seven Yale athletes. These were like, you know, Olympic quality athletes. And he put them on the diet, and they improved their athletic performance by 35%. And that was all published in Dr. Chittenden's book about this subject. And he did experiments on his patients. He checked their urine. He took careful dietary histories. He made careful clinical observations, did all the scientific tests that were available today. And yet, his findings and all the research that has been done over the last hundred years that confirms exactly what he said, that we need a very small amount of protein in our diet, has been virtually ignored when it comes to your health and your family's health, and you are taught to eat high protein diets. And you believe that's what's necessary based upon social bigotry that occurred in the mid-1800s. Another one of my heroes. William Rose. William Rose's work actually is on the shoulders of a couple other people. They're Osborne and Mandel. Osborne and Mandel, they published their research in about 1913. They were doing experiments on rats. Now you remember, may remember these from your high school or junior high biology. Do you remember the charts in the book that told you about class A or superior protein and class B or inferior protein? 
They had these little, little graphs, little charts in the book, and they said class A was animal protein, class B or inferior was plant protein. Well, that came from Osborne and Mendel's work that was published in 1913. What they did is they took rats, they grew them on vegetable proteins. They grew terrible, scrawny little rats. And then they took and they gave the rats some animal protein. They grew wonderfully. Now, what they didn't realize were rats are not people. And that was the problem. <laughs> rats had different nutritional requirements. And subsequent to that, they discovered that in the protein were components called amino acids. And these amino acids went and built all the proteins. And then what they decided was, well, maybe rats can't make all the amino acids. And as research continued, they found that rats couldn't make 10 amino acids. They had to be in the food, so they were called essential. Then William Rose, he took over that rat research in the 30s, and he found the last two amino acids. And he said, you know, I've got a pretty good idea. You know what I'd like to do? He says, I would like to take and find out whether people are different than rats. I want to do these same experiments on people. So he gathered together his students who wanted to be in his experiments because they knew that they would live in infamy because they'd get their initials in his scientific papers and they'd be famous forever. And so he had lots of volunteers. They did experiments that you could not do today because of ethical reasons. He raised them on synthetic mixtures to find out what the requirements for protein were for people. And what he found out was that people required very little protein. And he found out that actually people could make 12 of the essential, 12 of the amino acids, so they were called unessential. We only needed eight. We were two better than a rat. We only had eight essential amino acids in our food. William Rose published 17 papers in the biochemical literature that are considered classic, classic papers to this day. He's one of the most famous researchers on protein research that has ever existed. And he clearly showed in his research that all plant foods, all starches and vegetables, will supply in excess all of the amino acids that we need, all the protein needs that we have. And that was published in the early 1950s. Now, you'd think that would settle it, but it really hasn't. There was an interesting paper published in October of 2001, a long overdue paper. It was published by the Nutrition Committee of the American Heart Association. They published a paper on how dangerous high-protein diets are. They talked about the Atkins diet. They would talk about uh, the South Beach diet if it was around then, because that fits into the discussion. They talked about the Sugar Busters diet and the Zone diet, and they said these diets they don't result in long-term weight loss. These kinds of diets, they're dangerous to your bones and to your kidneys. They will raise your cholesterol and promote artery disease. They said all of that. But they said something else that was kind of interesting that really got my attention. They said plant foods do not contain all the amino acids. Yes. And that's not true. And I wrote them a letter and I explained to them about William Rose's research and the other research that has been done over the last 50 to 100 years that confirms that plants are complete in their supply of nutrients, especially proteins and amino acids. And I sent them the scientific research, and my letter got published in the American Heart Association Journal of Circulation. Now, they weren't particularly happy about what I had to say, but to this date, they had not been able to deny the scientific facts. But unfortunately, the American Heart Association is well, most likely, your doctor, your nutritional consultant, counselor, your nutritional counselor, they are recommending that you eat lots of meat and lots of protein to get all your amino acids and your protein. Now, why is this important that this kind of information gets straightened out and the American Heart Association starts telling you the truth about this? It's because it really affects your personal life, your daily life. Say, for example, your spouse had a heart attack. And you walked into the doctor's office and said, Doctor, I really love this man. He makes lots of money. And he's real warm at night. And I want to keep him. So I'm going to put him on a vegetarian diet. Doctor says, can't do that. Well, how come, doctor, I can't do that? He says, because you're not going to get all the protein and amino acids you need from just eating plants. Well, you step forward and say, how do you know that? And your doctor says, because the American Heart Association Nutrition Committee says so. Well, the American Heart Association Nutrition Committee is dead wrong. And the consequences will apply in your life. And unfortunately, they're still stubborn to this day. They won't take and print a retraction. 
even though if you read the articles and the ones that subsequently followed my letter that appeared in the journal circulation, you'll see that they don't have a leg to stand on. The foods were, com were designed complete before they hit the dinner table. We have uh, lots of arguments about what we should eat based upon human history, <coughs> eons of evolution, or some of you don't like to talk about evolution. Let's talk about it in terms of divine creation. That's okay. Let's talk about this whole subject in those terms as opposed to evolution, if you choose. How we are today must reflect what's happened to us in the past. There's an argument out there that says that we should be eating meat because we were once hunter-gatherers. And as a consequence of being hunter-gatherers, which ate a lot of meat, that's the kind of diet we should have. But the hunter-gatherer time in our history was just a short period of time. It was maybe 250,000 years ago up until about 25,000 years ago. It was a tough time for people. Hunter-gatherers had a difficult time. There are still some hunter-gatherer populations around today like the Eskimos, like uh, certain tribes in South America and in Africa. These people live on the extremes of society, as did people who were hunter-gatherers back in this period of time. But you'll find the argument that people make that you should eat meat because of this period of human evolution, of human existence, where they were hunter-gatherers. Well, hunter-gatherer period of time was not a very successful time. You remember the kind of culture that they had based upon what they produced. A few stick drawings in the caves. They were so busy trying to find enough food to survive, they had little time to do anything else. There is a time even before hunter-gatherer that goes back to four million years, if you believe, in evolution goes back four million years where people finally stood upright and it is said by scientific research of our evolution that people ate an almost pure vegetarian diet from four million years up until the time they became hunter-gatherers. Now this has a biblical reference to it. That early time, four million years ago up to 250,000 years ago, what was that? That was the time in the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? And then what happened is Adam and Eve, they got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And they were told they were going to toil by the sweat of their brow to survive, as they did as hunter-gatherers. It was a tough existence. But you will hear people, hear people argue that you should be a meat-eater because of this difficult time in human history. When did the human being really become successful culturally? The human being became successful about 12,000 to 25,000 years ago when the human being harnessed its food environment, when they became agricultural when they started to grow various crops, when they domesticated some animals. But amazingly, it was a crop-based culture that developed about 12,000 to 25,000 years ago. And what happened then is we were freed from the task of always looking for food. And as a consequence, we could develop music and art and literature. That's when people became successful. We go on these various trips, these McDougal adventure trips. And particularly, I enjoy the trips in South America and Central America when we visit the Incas, the Aztecs, the Mayans. We'll get a group of McDougal people on these trips. We'll be listening to the guide, and the guide will talk about the culture. And eventually, somebody will ask, well, what do they eat? What do these, what do these Incas, what do these Mayans eat? This agricultural society, what was their diet? Well, the guide will say, well, they ate beans and corn and squa squashes. And about that time, somebody would say, well, they ate the McDougal diet, didn't they? <laughs> well, of course they did. Of course they did. Almost every culture ate that way, except those that lived on the extremes. The hunter-gatherers, like, of course, your Eskimos, the people who live far away in a very difficult environment. So don't let anybody tell you that you should be a meat-eater because of this particular time in our human development evolution or your biblical interpretation of what goes on. Let's take a look at our closest ancestors. Let's take a look at the chimpanzee. The Wayne State University researchers tell us that humans are only slightly remodeled chimpanzee-like apes. There's only a few genes different. So maybe the chimpanzee gives an indication of how we should eat. Well, the chimpanzees and other apes are essentially vegetarians. They eat fruits and leaves and flowers and bark. And yes, they do eat some animal product. They'll take a little twig and they'll try and get some termites out of the wood. and They'll eat those. Or another thing they do is they'll go out and they'll catch small animals. But people have studied this kind of social behavior in these, these uh, primates like the chimpanzee, and they don't catch those little animals for nutritional requirements. They catch them for status. The male chimpanzee goes out and catches the little animal and brings it back to the female, and guess what he gets? <laughs> 
let's take a look at the human anatomy and physiology and decide whether or not we're carnivores, omnivores, or herbivores. Let's take a look at our present situation because that really is a reflection of our design creation, if you choose, or millions and hundreds of millions of evolution. Take, for example, our tooth structure. These are carnivores. One of my favorite carnivores is the shark. The shark has very sharp teeth, and the intention of those teeth is to do one thing, and that's to eat other animals. And you should know that shark teeth point inward, and that's because food only goes in one direction, and that's inward. That animal is designed to capture, kill, and swallow other animals. And so are other carnivores, just like your cat. It's got these large canine teeth that reach down, grab the small rodent, put holes in it, kill it, and then they consume it. That's what it's designed for. It's interesting, the cat's tongue has on the tip of it, it has sensors, taste buds. And those taste buds are stimulated by aminos, by proteins. It has no sugar sensitive taste buds on the tip of the tongue. That was no accident. That's because that animal is designed to enjoy eating other animals. Now how about people's teeth? You take a look at the chimpanzee, and you can see that they're flat. They're basically vegetarian animals. How about us? Our teeth are also flat. The blades of our teeth are not shaped by, like those of a cat or other carnivore. Now, people tell me all the time, wait a minute, you're missing something, Dr. McDougall. You forgot the incisor teeth that we have at the corners of our mouth. Now, there has been a time in my career when I've lectured to dentists. I used to lecture to about 12,000 dentists and dental hygienists every year. And one of the things I would ask them is I would ask them to come up and show me the canine teeth in their mouth or show me a picture of canine teeth in any patient they've ever seen. And to this date, I have never seen an example of a human being having teeth that look like a cat. They're designed for different purposes. Our teeth are designed to bite off things like apples and to grind things like grains. On the tip of our tongue, we have taste buds for sweet carbohydrate. We're designed as seekers of carbohydrate. Carbohydrate was once corn and potatoes and rice and fruits and vegetables, maybe a little honey. Now, of course, industries discovered that, and they dump sugar in everything from baby food to geriatric food. 150 pounds a year is dumped in your food to get you to buy it. There's a problem with eating meat. It's called a cafe coronary. There's a maneuver designed to treat that. It's called the Heimlich Maneuver, and Henry Heimlich is a friend of mine. He's a real person. Henry Heimlich, when he got sick, he came to my clinic to get well, one of the greatest honors in my life. Henry Heimlich has saved more lives than any human being that's ever walked this earth, not just by the Heimlich Maneuver, but also by the Heimlich chest tube, which they use in war times. But Henry Heimlich taught the Heimlich Maneuver to take and save people's lives who got things caught in their windpipe. And the thing that gets caught in their windpipe is almost always a chunk of meat. It's called a cafe coronary. You don't get grains of rice stuck in your windpipe. Why does it get stuck in the windpipe? Because we're not designed to swallow those kinds of things, and as a result, they get stuck and people die. My mother didn't understand that when I was a little kid. When I was a little kid, I had to eat my meat before I could get up and leave the dinner table. And I would chew, and I would chew, and I would chew, and I would chew. And finally, I get this leathery ball in my cheek that I would find some way to slip under the plate or feed to the dog. Now, my mother said, you've got to eat that to get your protein. What she should have said to me is, Johnny, don't eat that. You've got the wrong kind of teeth. Give it to the dog. <laughs> As you go through the intestinal tract, you find some other interesting things. We have a very low acid content in our stomach. A carnivore has a very high, high acid content, which the purpose is to digest all that protein. We have a liver with a limited capacity to metabolize cholesterol. And as a result, when we eat too much cholesterol, it backs up in the system, gets in the arteries, gets in our tissue, causes problems. A dog and a cat does not have a limited capacity. Their liver just cranks up when you eat that cholesterol, turns it into bile acids, and excretes it from the body. You can feed dogs and cats egg yolks, and they won't get hardening into the arteries because the liver just excretes it. So what's your conclusion? We were born with the wrong kind of liver, you say. <laughs> no, no, no. We shouldn't eat like a dog and a cat. That's what you should say. 
When you look at our ball, you see that we have a very long, complex ball. The ball of a carnivore like a cat is tubular without much change in structure. We have a lot of convolution. We have sacs that are typical of plant-eating animals. These sacculations occur in our large intestine. Only herbivorous animals have these kinds of sacculations there so that the food can further digest because this is plant food that has to take and sit for a while in the intestine and be worked on by our enzymes and bacteria to fully digest it. That's why our intestine is designed that way. A cat needs to get that food in, get the nutrients absorbed, and get it out of the body quickly before it putrefies. There are different nutritional requirements that tell us what kind of diet we're supposed to be on. You see, we evolved in a certain environment, or were designed such, so that we wouldn't have wasteful things around. As a matter of fact, think about this. If you had enzymes that did certain jobs, and you didn't need those, keep those enzymes around because what needed to be done was right there present around you, you didn't have to make those things, why would you keep those enzymes? Or if you had to make things that weren't in your environment, you'd keep those systems, wouldn't you? Well, take a look at ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid in a dog or a cat is called ascorbic acid. In people, it's called vitamin C. It's a vitamin. You can't make it. Vitamin C is only present in plants. Because we were always in an environment of plant foods, we didn't have to keep the enzyme systems that made ascorbic acid. we just get it from the plants. It was always there. Whereas dogs and cats, they had to keep a system to make ascorbic acid because they were basically meat eaters. So it goes with arachidonic acid. That is found in meat products. Animals like dogs and cats who are carnivores, they can't make arachidonic acid. We can. We can make it out of linoleic acid, which is originally made by plants. So we just take linoleic acid, we turn it into arachidonic acid. We kept those systems. Why? Because we weren't always in a situation where we had a meat environment. So it is with certain amino acids that are essential for carnivores that aren't essential for us because we can make these things. And they are present in meat. Here's a couple of interesting examples. How do we cool ourselves? And how does that fit in terms of whether or not we're herbivores or plant eaters or whether or not we're meat eaters? And how do we drink water? I mean, think about that in terms of whether we're a carnivore or a plant eater. Well, what you will notice is that a plant eating animal cools itself by sweating. And a meat eater, what do they do? They pant. How about it when it comes to drinking water? Now, I've had dinner with a lot of you, and I haven't seen one of you lap your water yet. <laughs> you sip it like other plant-eating animals. So basically, your anatomy and physiology is all designed physically for you to be a plant eater, but also psychologically. Now, how do you feel about this picture? Is this pleasant? Does this make you feel good? Hungry? Do you salivate over this? I bet your cat would. This is disgusting. Why? Because psychologically you are also set up for a certain kind of food. And you react very negatively to this. I remember when I was a kid, I found out that they put horse meat in my hamburgers that they sold at the stand down the street, and I was disgusted. One time they put kangaroo in my hamburgers. I got sick to my stomach thinking I was eating kangaroo instead of cow. And then I went to France in 1970, and guess what they had on the menu? Horse. There are cultures with, that eat black dog and cats. And they think they're a delicacy, but we find them revolting. Why? Because we're not naturally set up to enjoy these kinds of things. We have to get used to them. And generally, we have to cover them up with all kinds of, of sauces to get them down. But that's different when it comes to plant foods. How do you react to this? This is appealing. That's because you're designed psychologically to find this enjoyable. This is not a mistake that this is pleasant. If I handed you a new fruit, this was done to me one time when I lived in Hawaii. Somebody brought me a star fruit. I'd never tried it. I didn't look at it with disgust. I said, oh, that looks interesting. I'll try it. And I loved it because I'm naturally designed to enjoy this kind of food. I told you women are attached to dairy. Well, how about men? They're attached to meat. You know, meat's a man thing. You know, it's bringing home the bacon. Meat's associated with uh, hunting and killing, and that's a man thing. Butchering and power and aggression, those are men things, right? 
We're talking about uh, virility and passion and potency and strength. Those are men things. Those are meek things. And it even gets carried away into aggressive behavior and violent personalities associated with me, right? And those are man things. And as I mentioned and would like to tell you again, men have trouble giving up meat. But is that really a man thing? Is, that, is meat really a man thing? Is that a male thing, a potency thing, a virility thing? I don't think so. Not if you knew the anatomy and physiology of a man. A man has a particular kind of sexual anatomy that's shared by other vegetarian animals. If you look at this picture, what you see is the male anatomy. You see the prostate gland down below. You see the urethra coming through the prostate gland. Below the bladder and right attached above on the prostate gland are two sacs called seminal vesicles. Seminal vesicles are to store the semen. Meat-eating animals do not have seminal vesicles. Only vegetarian animals have seminal vesicles. Man is the only meat-eating animal with seminal vesicles. Is that OK? Or are we in violation of our anatomy and physiology? Let's see. What happens when men and families violate the principles of normal natural human nutrition in terms of their sexualness, in terms of their virility, in terms of their potency? Well, if your mother likes lots of meat, what happens is she gets lots of estrogen in her body. And when she's pregnant with you, you are bathed in a sea of estrogens. As a consequence, the male ends up developing a smaller penis, tinier testicles, and the penis is often deformed, where the urethra, instead of emptying at the tip of the penis, empties at the base of the penis. This is called hypospadia. Also a result is only one testicle descending. It's called cryptorchism, a congenital defect due to too much estrogen in the body which is most commonly caused by your mother loving meat and other animal products. Now, the meat and the animal products come from these foods in themselves. They also come from the estrogens come from environmental contaminants. And it's estimated that 89 to 99% of the environmental contaminants that you have in your body come from your food. And most of those, as we discussed, come from animal products. All right. So you're a male and you decide you want to eat lots of meat so you can be virile and potent. What do we find? Well, men who eat lots of meat have decreased ejaculate volume, low sperm count. Now, that doesn't sound very potent to me. Shortened sperm life, poor sperm fertility, genetic damage, and infertility from all of those hormones, those female hormones and those environmental contaminants floating around in a male system. Studies have been done on sperm counts frozen sperm from 75 years ago, and they find men today have about a third the amount of sperm they had 75 years ago. Organic farmers in the Netherlands, who are very careful about what they eat, they eat vegetable foods, low in pesticides, have much higher sperm counts than the typical male who eats the Western diet. Are you kind of getting the idea here? This is not a real macho thing, guys. And then what happens if you continue that behavior you develop lower testosterone levels. Testosterone is the male hormone that gives you sex drive, gives you secondary sexual characteristics, makes you a man. Well, they, mail, they have measured the testosterone levels in people who eat various kinds of diets and vegans, in other words, people who eat no animal products at all, no dairy at all, they have 13% uh, more testosterone than meat eaters and 8% more testosterone than lacto-ovo vegetarians. So you don't even get all the male hormone you ought to have by eating this kind of high meat diet. And then as you age, other serious problems happen. You get erectile dysfunction. What happens is the man's penis becomes flaccid. Now, of course, we have an answer for that these days. But this is a serious problem, erectile dysfunction, not just, not just uh, physically, but also psychologically. And it's not because men lose interest in women. I know that. And I'm 57 years old, and I can tell you it hasn't happened to me yet. I remember one time I asked my dad. He was about uh, 78 years old. I said, Dad, you know, all I do is I just think about women all the time. I think about sex all the time, and I can't get my work done. Dad, I said, when am I going to stop thinking about sex all the time? He said to me, son, 
He says, you're going to have to ask somebody older than me. <laughs> so why doesn't the organ work? It's not because the interest isn't there. It doesn't work because the blood vessels get all plugged up to the penis. The penis gets erect by blood flowing into it, and it gets engorged. And when you have diseased blood vessels, they don't work, and so you become flaccid. That doesn't sound like a very macho reason to eat meat to me. And then you end up with a problem where you can't urinate because eating that rich diet causes the prostate to get large. It's not a cancer situation, but closes it down on the urethra, and you get obstruction of your urine flow, and you can't urinate, and then eventually you get prostate cancer. And if you think you had sexual problems before, wait till they treat you for prostate cancer, and then you're going to kiss your sex life goodbye in most cases. People are intended to be vegetarians. I've given you the evidence. I've given it to you from the point of view of disease, from the point of view of anatomy and physiology, from the point of view of history. We are primarily intended to be vegetarians. Does it mean we can't eat any meat at all? I don't know that that's the case. Maybe you could have a little meat in your diet, but it doesn't add anything to it. The reason we get fooled is this, is that people are survivors. We're the best thing going as far as development in the animal kingdom. We're survivors. Some of you have tested your ability to survive just like I have. You can live on two packs of cigarettes, a half a bottle of whiskey and grease and meat all day long, and you survive. But does that necessarily mean it's the right thing? I challenge you with you could survive better if you had better information and acted on it. And I also challenge you to start looking at your life from another point of view. Instead of saying, how much can I survive, why don't you say, how well could I live if I followed the right set of rules? I mean, how much just good vigor and health and, and uh, feelings, good feelings and pleasant personal appearance and enjoyment I could get out of this body if I took good care of it? Wouldn't that be a novel way to look at yourself? I think so. Well, being a vegetarian is a very threatening thing. And so there was an article in the paper recently, if you can't be a vegetarian, can't give up meat, maybe you could be a flexitarian. So we got this new word, a flexitarian. Doesn't that sound good? And as I said, you know, you may be able to include a little meat in your diet, and maybe that's what you ought to be. And certainly I'm not trying to teach you a religion called vegetarianism. As a matter of fact, I eat meat myself. I eat meat every other Thanksgiving, just to prove I'm not a vegetarian. I don't like to be called names. <laughs> My good friend, he goes salmon fishing. He didn't do it last year, but I hope he does it next year. I eat a little piece of salmon. Now, I could eat a lot more meat than that and still be in the same health that I'm in. I just don't particularly care for it. But a lot of you get into this situation, which this newspaper article reflects. It says you can't be a vegetarian, can't give up the meat, be a flexitarian. Maybe there's some value in that. Maybe there's some value in some other catchy terms, too. Maybe you could be a choicetarian. <laughs> or how about a, a food smartitarian? Or how about a non-gluttonarian? <laughs> or maybe I'll rarely make myself sickitarian. Or how about I love myself a Terrian? Maybe that's what you could be. You have that opportunity with the right information. But I want to talk to you about how to use that information most effectively, about how to make changes. The best way to change, and people ask me this all the time, they say, OK, I get the message, but how do I do it? How do I change? And Nancy Reagan said it best. Just say no. That's the way to do it. And that's the way human behavior is. That's what I have a problem with a little bit of meat or a little bit of dairy or a little bit of this or a little bit of that. It's too hard. It's too hard if you give yourself permission. I have never met a smoker that quit smoking by cutting down, ever. I have never met an alcoholic who solved their problem by switching to beer, ever. It is too difficult to take and eat just a little bit. You open the refrigerator, you're only supposed to eat two ounces of chicken every other day, and what's sitting in your refrigerator? Uh, chicken. And plus, you gave yourself permission to eat it, so it can't be all that bad. It's much easier to make distinct boundaries for yourself. People have much more success when they make things black and white instead of gray and yellow. If you really want to change, do this. And that's the way we teach the program. We teach the program this way. The foods that support your health are starches, vegetables, and fruits, unprocessed largely. 
And feast foods are things like candy bars and cakes and ice creams and turkeys for Thanksgiving and eggs for Easter and so on. Those are feast foods. I see no reason that healthy people who are trim can't eat them on festive occasions. Unless you're like me with cigarettes. You see, I've, I've got this addiction. Fortunately, the last cigarette I've had was 35 years ago. But I am still an addict. And I smoke two packs of cigarettes a day if I smoke. I don't smoke two cigarettes a day. I smoke zero or two packs. Nothing in between. Those of you who have problems with alcohol or drugs or food, some of you are the same way. You can't have just a little turkey on Thanksgiving. You go to the buffet, you start at one end, you don't quit for the next six months. If you recognize this as your personality, as your way of dealing with life, then deal with food like I do with cigarettes or like some people do with alcohol. Just say no. Just don't do it. If, however, you are the kind of person who is not so addicted or habituated to these kinds of things, and you can have a little meat on a special occasion, I see no particular problem for it. But it's really a matter of choice. And that begins with getting the right information and deciding that your life's worth it. And I'm sure it is. I'm sure your family's worth it. I'm sure the enjoyment you get every day is worth it. And now you have the information. And my recommendation is to keep meat as a delicacy at most. And maybe you ought to give it up for next Thanksgiving, too. After all, I would guess you've had enough meat for a lifetime. You've probably eaten more meat than 99.9% .9 of the people that ever walked this earth. One more feast meal isn't worth it, I bet. It's not worth a heart attack or other health problems. So make the kind of changes that Nancy Reagan suggested. You'll have the kind of health you deserve. Thank you very much.